Hey, this is Block Ops. Got a, another whiteboard video for you. Finally got my setup here at my home office with my whiteboard handy. So hopefully I'll be doing a few more of these videos for you as we go through the next stage of what we're doing. You saw my last video. You saw that our four-year lease that we did on our build out in a rented warehouse is up. So we're moving out of that. And that was part of the plan. We had quickly gotten up to speed and mined in 2016 and built it into a about a six to 700 kilowatt mining facility, running a bunch of ASIC miners and GPU miners there. And we had done it for a four year lease because I knew something would change at the Bitcoin halving and certainly has. We've learned a lot on the most cost effective way to do mining. And by far it's to use containers to build out the infrastructure and find an inexpensive place to do a ground lease for that container and bring the container where there's inexpensive electricity. In fact, I was chatting with someone in China, and he says that there they've got it down to when it's rainy season, a lot of people put their containers on trucks and take them out to locations where they can plug in to two and a half cent per kilowatt hour electricity, while the dams have extra electricity during rainy season. And then when rainy season is over, I guess it's about a six month period, they truck them to where there's coal plants and they can get I don't know, four, four and a half cent per kilowatt hour electricity there. That's pretty ingenious, but definitely containers and taking them to where the electricity is the most inexpensive is the way to go. It gives you bargaining ability and having built out buildings and containers it's a lot less expensive and there's less regulation to build out containers. So I wanna talk about what it is my design constraints are and I'm gonna be going through. And as I go through, I'll explain the differences, probably in, be in multiple videos, uh, what I would do from a reusing electrical equipment, which is what I'm doing, to doing a new design. But anyway, the constraints are, we wanna reuse all the existing equipment that we're taking out of our current building and put it into a container. We want to make it as inexpensive as possible. Got into mining a number of years ago, put in some investment capital, and at this point, we're operating off earnings. So every, just like every other business, keeping your costs low is really important. Want to make it transportable? In this case, only transportable by truck. If you saw some of my previous videos, you saw I did a mining container design where we could close the doors and actually put it on a ship and ship it internationally. That's not part of this design parameter. What I'm not sure yet is if we're gonna do a single 40 foot or two 20 foot containers. Depends on a few things, but I'll talk about the power, the way we're gonna lay it out, the cooling and network. Just in the planning stage right now, probably gonna start this actual construction here in June, July, August timeframe. We've got a little bit of time because uh, a number of the Antminer S9 and L3s that we unplugged recently because they're not profitable. We're boxing them up and we're not getting rid of them yet. We're holding on to them because perhaps in a year or so, we're gonna be able to plug those back in and we're gonna need a lot of shelf space and power to be able to plug in all the S9 and, and L3. Maybe not, maybe we will. Oops, gotta be uh, ready for all eventualities. On this container design, let's talk next, big picture about how we're gonna size this thing. So here we're getting to a little bit of math, and don't worry, I'm gonna step you through it uh, a little bit at a time. These are engineering numbers, they're kind of approximate, so they might not end up being what we actually do. So let's figure out, if we're gonna do a container design, and this is like a 40 foot container, where we have a row of miners down in the middle, or the ceiling, air coming in one side and going out the other. I'm not gonna talk about the specifics yet about how we're gonna do that. But what do we have to do to actually size some? Now, there, there are some options that we have. Some folks do, do container designs where they remove this entire wall. The entire wall is filled up with filters. And then there's no additional fans beyond the fans that are in the miners themselves. They put uh, a shelter overhead to kind of keep the rain out, help keep the rain out, help keep the hot air from recirculating back into the cold air side. And there's, it's a flow through system. That, that's a pretty good way of doing it. Now, if you're gonna remove the entire wall of the container, obviously you'll have to put structural type things. And then there's a lot of filters that you're gonna to have to remove and wash. So to me, this is better for big mining, 
installations where you have a lot of containers and you're able to hire people to go clean filters all the time. I like to build systems that I can just leave them alone for a while. So I got to go, you know, clean filters maybe every few months uh, or if it's pollen season, a little more often than that. But I like to have fans that pull through air and do smaller intakes and, um, and have filters and have fewer filters that way. So that's, there's no right or wrong answer. It's a design style. Some people prefer less moving parts because there's less things to break that way. If you don't buy any fans, then there's no rotating machinery, no belts to change, no problems like that. It's all on what it is that you're going to be doing. So there's not really a wrong answer or a right answer. It's more of a style type thing. So I'm going to do an assumption where I don't take out the entire wall, but instead I put in some louvers and filters. The louvers keep out the rain because we don't obviously want water coming into the liners and then fans pulling out on the exhaust side. That's, that's pretty good design. So let's big picture talk about that design and really round numbers here. 400 cubic feet per minute, it's RP metric folks, 400 cubic feet per minute for an Antminer S19. Fairly standard, that's double what we used for the design uh, in the past of 200 cubic feet per minute for an S9. But an S9, you know, tops out at about 1500 watts and an S19 is roughly around 3200 watts. So that's pretty close. So if I talk about the existing electrical equipment where, that I have, so that's a 1200 amp three phase, three phase uh, distribution panel at 208 volts because we're doing phase to phase and that, that's how the electric company is delivering it. It's not coming in at 115 or uh, being done phase to neutral at, at 240. So these are really rough numbers. So 1200 amps, 208 volts uh, times 1.7 when we go from three phase to single phase because three phase is a lot more efficient. Um, and we break it out. That gives us about 420 kilowatts max for each uh, large 1200 amp. Now we've got 200 of these, and so we could theoretically do 850 kilowatts into this container. Again, if it was 240 volts, we'd be up above a megawatt for a container design. But if we're talking about okay, 850 kilowatts that we can supply, how many S19 miners, really roughly, is that? 280. Okay, 280. Knowing that we have about 400 cubic feet per minute per S19 and 280 S19 miners, that really roughly comes out to 120,000 cubic feet per minute of airflow that we need to bring in. Why do we need to bring in that much airflow? Well, we want to supply the intakes of the miners with enough fresh air that they're not recirculating hot air from the hot side of the miner to the cold side. So we need to supply an intake of about 120,000 cubic feet per minute. Okay, great. So if we're going to do that, maybe we want to size fans to total up to 120,000 cubic feet per minute. Uh, and how do we figure out how much actual louver area we get? Now, louver design, you need to speak to an HVAC, you know, heating, ventilation, air conditioning professional. It goes into a lot of things, and there's a lot more engineering calculations here, but I'm just looking for rough numbers. The rough numbers, if you have a louver, and louvers are designed so that if it rains, the rain doesn't really come in. And that's you know, rain that falls straight that doesn't get sucked in. If it's driving rain, that's a different story. But we wanna uh, keep that. So a good speed for most louvers uh, is that you want about 600, uh, feet per minute, less than 600 feet per minute moving through the louver. And so if we want about 120,000 cubic feet per minute, uh, and we want it to be less than 600 feet per minute speed, and this is taking into account that only about 50% of the louver is usable area. That's where the 600 comes from. So it would be up around the 1200. That gives us that we need about 200 square feet of louvers on the intake side, filtered louvers. Okay, so maybe six, four foot by eight foot louver section. That translates into, okay, we, we do six, four foot by eight foot louver sections on a 40 foot container. And if we have 40,000 cubic feet 
per minute fans. That means uh, we can do. We have forty thousand cubic. Feet? No, Our, the ones that we've got, I think, are about twenty-five or thirty thousand cubic feet. We'll say they're thirty thousand. So thirty thousand cubic feet per minute. That means we need four cube. 30,000 cubic feet per minute fans. So this is our big picture design. We do six four by eight foot louvers with uh, filters behind them. We do four 30,000 cubic feet per minute fans. We have a row of miners down the middle and we have two big 1200 amp switch panels and that get with six sub panels and with this design, we would put, probably put those two 1200 amp panels on the end uh, and then distribute the smaller sub panels, six of them. So we do either one, two, three, four, five, six lined up with the louvers, or we uh, do a couple sections of them. And then we can then distribute our uh, individual minor connections from that. So this is the idea of how we're going to reuse our existing equipment into a 40 foot shipping container and it takes into account the airflow that we need or the type of uh, miners. It takes into account the power, the filtering, and the cooling. Let's talk about the electric power a little bit more, how we bring it in from the power company and provide it to the transformer. We have two different options. There's the preferred option, and then there's what you can deal with with your local power company. So uh, the power service that comes in, if you can supply your own transformer, then the Power company typically comes in at maybe 14,400 volts. You gotta check with what they actually bring it in, but that's a typical power that they come in. They bring it in at high power because, excuse me, high volts, because the higher the volts, less current has to be uh, put through the wire to supply the same amount of power. And then the transformer transforms the voltage to a lower voltage. So the sweet spot in the market, best pricing and availability that you're gonna get is if you get a 2500 KVA 415Y transformer. And when you do the Y is because you're planning on connecting from phase to neutral, and the phase to neutral connection will give you a 240 volt connection. I'm told this is a common type of transformer in Europe, Latin America, not as much here in the United States, but there are places that you can get them. So if you can provide your own transformer and then the power company hooks into that, then you have 240 volts coming off a phase to neutral connection. There's advantages to that. I'll talk to you about what I'm designing because what our power company does is they provide the transformer. You can only do the transformers that they provide. So we're gonna be looking to get a 2000 KVA 208 volt Delta transformer. Delta is because we're gonna connect phase to phase. And when we connect phase to phase, we'll get 208 volts AC, but it takes two breakers to do it. So it takes a little bit more electrical wiring, but we don't get the efficiency in the panels that we'd want. And, but that's the way it is. Sometimes you gotta work with what life hands you. So within this connection for a single one of our 1200 amp panels here, we will, have the power company bring in the transformer. They'll hook a meter into it. There, there's three phase uh, cabling that comes in. There's a service disconnect uh, on the outside of the building. If there's a fire inside, it's nice to be able to come and disconnect the electricity on the outside. And then that comes to 1200 amp three phase panel here where we have three 400 volt big breakers. Volt. Excuse me, 400 amp breakers. And these connect to the what I call the sub panels. I don't always get the names quite right on this stuff, but it's close enough. Then on each of these, we'll have 20 connections that come off that are 208 volts AC single phase, 30 amps to a power distribution unit. So overall, for each one of these 1200 amp panels, we'll be able to have 60 connections coming off. So we can either, and this is why I said we could do two 20 foot containers or a single 40 foot container. This power section, and we do one of these in a 20 foot container, or we would do two of these in a 40 foot container. So that's the design that we have reusing the equipment. TVSS, a transient voltage surge suppressor, 
that's in case there's a lightning strike, it prevents all this equipment from blowing up. At least that's the idea. So this is how we're gonna do the power. If I was designing it from the get-go, I would plan on wiring my power distribution units directly into the panel. Um, we didn't have that design from the start. What we have is the connection coming to a receptacle and then the PDU plugging into the receptacle. Costs a little bit more to do that. We've already got the parts, so that's what you're gonna see us do. But big picture, that's how we're gonna design the power and this all has to fit inside the container, although the service disconnect uh, is on kind of the back of this 1200 amp panel. So we're gonna put that on the end of the container and that's going to we're going to drill a hole in it. We'll have the service disconnect on the outside. That's pretty much how the power is going to go. And then this is three phase right here. So uh, the fans that we have are three phase fans because they're much more efficient than single phase fans. If you have a single phase fan, you have to have a start run capacitor so that it can pretend to have three phases. So it's better off that if you have three phase electricity, you just use three phase fan to the get go. And so those will connect uh, to the fans um, so that we, we don't have to worry about connecting the fans off there. That's how the power is going to work uh, in a more detailed fashion. Let's talk about how we're going to do the data networking. This part kind of trips people up a little bit sometimes. There's a few basic things that we want to have. First off, we don't want to pay too much for data network switches, but we do want to have reliability. My recommendation is that wherever you are, you get two internet connections. You get a primary connection, that's a wired connection. If you can get a static IP address, that would be great. It's okay if you don't. You can use dynamic DNS. Or that could be a wireless broadband. If you don't have a, a wired connection, that's a, at a good speed. Wherever you're at, you can, there's probably people that do wireless broadband. Or if you have a building nearby, you can stick up an antenna and use wireless bridges with parabolic dishes. There's ways to get a good, reliable internet connection. And you need a backup internet connection because sometimes this connection goes down. And so there's good 4G internet connection. Cisco now has a 4G uh, connection. I use a lot of Cisco data networking equipment. I like it, it's not that expensive. There's always people that know how to use Cisco data networking equipment around. It's well documented and there's 24 hour support that you get uh, that you can either buy and add to it or like with the Meraki firewall, it comes with it as part of the package. So I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in the using Cisco Meraki firewall. It doesn't do IPv6. For mining, we don't really need IPv6. So in this case, we would use, for example, an MX67 wireless, provides Wi-Fi inside, which is handy. You don't really need it. But that has dual uplink capability, so it'll use the primary uplink, and when that's not available, it will switch over to the secondary uplink. It'll send you notifications when that happens. The other nice thing about the Meraki firewall is it's cloud managed. You can manage the firewall remotely and make changes that way. I like to use 10100 switches, 48 port switches. I prefer these days to use managed switches because I use SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol, to manage, uh, to monitor all my network equipment and send me an email when there's a problem. Uh, there's a good open source network management program that you can use called uh, Zabbix to manage any type of switches that are, that are smart, but you can also use um, dumb switches as well. But just 10100, you don't need gigabit speed because all your miners are, are at 10100 speed. Uh, what I usually do is a stack of switches, so a gigabit connection to the firewall, then connect these switches to each other and then another connection back. And it, say, well, you don't typically want a network switch loop, but these are all switches these days use what's called spanning tree protocol. It'll put one of these connections into standby. And that way, if you have a, a problem with any of these connections anywhere, all the information will flow the other way. So in our 280 minor example, if each of these is 48 ports, we'd need about six switches total. So we could do two stacks of three switches. You put a switch in, connect to the firewall, daisy chain two more off it, then do a connection back to the firewall. Heck, you could home run all these. There's a lot of different ways to do it. I just like having no single point of failure on the switches. 
So two internet connections, a firewall that can do your network address translation. The other nice thing about this is uh, it has remote access VPN. So if you put, like I do, uh, I'll usually put uh, a small laptop sitting here connected to a network running Awesome Miner, uh, and that monitors all the help. Awesome. And that monitors and actually manages all the miners. Uh, that way, when I VPN in, I can just do a remote desktop to my Awesome Miner instance running here. I can see how things are going. I can the profitability of every machine. I can upgrade firmware, reboot it, set rules, all that kind of stuff. Uh, switches, this is SF250, and I use Zabbix to monitor it. We can talk about that in more detail if y'all are interested in a network overview. Uh, for these types of systems, I've made it easy. You can go to my blockoperations.com website. There's a store, so slash store. You click on the store link. You can see all these types of things. Yes, those are Amazon affiliate links there. Buy it from whoever you want. In fact, I recommend buying your Cisco equipment from a Cisco authorized reseller. You're getting it from the right path and you can get the support and other things like that. Temperature monitoring. Uh, I found, I've done a few different ways of doing temperature monitoring. I like this little device called the sensor push. So you put these little sensor push, Bluetooth, low, low energy Bluetooth devices in various places. And then you put a single gateway, connect the gateway into the switch and then you can see what the temperature is of your mining facility on your phone whenever you want and send you alerts if the temperature gets too that uh, and as far as managing temperature in the summer and the winter i've thought about doing we have actually done things where we vary the speed on the fans i've talked to people that do a temperature monitor and turn the fans and on and off easiest just to if it gets really cold, you turn some of the fans off and set up uh, a little bit of blowback through through the miners themselves. Uh, it doesn't really need to be that difficult. So that's how we set up the data networking. So in the new container design that we're doing, we've talked about what size, the power, the airflow, the data network, how many miners we can fit into it. Uh, and then here over the next few months, hopefully you'll see that as we go through the progression on this, and yeah, we're going to use some wood that we've got left over. Again, we got a lot of part of the company Georgia Pacific. Well, Georgia, we got a lot of we got a lot of so we use wood construction. Anyway, this is Roll for Sluice Block Ops signing off. Um, this container mining overview. Thanks.